When Ontario's teachers decided to fight Bill 115 by withdrawing extracurriculars from their students' lives, that got many people wondering just what is a teacher's job? From coaching to field trips to maintaining curriculum standards, what should teachers be expected to do and what do they think they should do? Joining us now to debate that, Earl Manners, Human Resources Administrator at the Trillium Lakelands District School Board. George Thomas, elementary teacher with the York Region District School Board. Stephen Hurley, elementary teacher with the Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. Misha Abarbanel, secondary teacher with the Toronto District School Board. Roy and Lee, elementary teacher with the York Region District School Board. And Zoe Brannigan Pipe, elementary teacher with the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. And it's great to have so many teachers uh, after a full day in the classroom joining us tonight on the set here. Great to have you all here. Thank you. Let me also say that our online editor, Daniel Kitts, and our producer, Sandra Jonas and Mary Taz, are taking your tweets right now. They want your comments for the following question. What do you consider part of a teacher's job? So chime in either on our website, theagenda.tvo.org, or as I suggested, via Twitter, and use the hashtag AgendaTVO. Okay, as we try to get a better understanding of what it is that you folks do and maybe what the public expects you folks to do, let me start with Earl. Uh, Earl, let's understand what's at stake here. What are the teachers who work for your school board, what have they lately been declining to do that they used to do because they were unhappy about Bill 115? What we found after the passage of Bill 115 at the end of December was that the work to work rule strike that ETFA was engaged in uh, prior to the passage of that legislation, and that was a legal strike, uh, continued following the passage of that legislation. Uh, every, uh, the ETFA continued to counsel and direct teachers en masse not to participate in those normal activities associated with teaching and learning. Like what? whether it be uh, nutrition programs, breakfast and lunch programs for needy kids, uh, PD activities for teachers to help them uh, ensure that students are getting the best education possible, the uh, excursions during the school day or field trips that may go uh, during the field day or into the evening or over a couple of days. Uh, all of those things were being boycotted and uh, that was uh, disrupting the normal operations of the school and uh, the education and, and learning of our students. Let me do a brief follow here, because words are important, and you called it a work-to-rule strike. Uh, I guess technically, all of the things that you just mentioned are not in the Education Act as being part of a teacher's job. So if they withdraw those services, is it fair to call it a strike? They are part of the normal activities and the expectations that go with teaching and learning. Uh, the Education Act doesn't define explicitly the, uh, the job of a teacher, but it does say and emphasize that the primary objective of, of uh, teachers is to encourage students in the pursuit of learning. And they do that by cooperating uh, with other staff, with parents, with the community, and with students themselves, uh, not only in the classroom, but uh, throughout the entire school environment and beyond uh, into the community. Let me emphasize, this is not about Bill 115. And on behalf of our board, I want to say that our <coughs> trustees do not support Bill 115 and government interference in collective bargaining. We don't support imposed collective agreements. But we also don't support illegal strike activities. The rules matter. And that's, if, if you're going to protest, uh, an attack on collective bargaining rights. You don't do that by violating the same bargaining rights you're trying to protect. Okay, let's get some feedback around the table here. Zoe, I want to start with you. Uh, after the whole Bill 115 fiasco happened, did you withdraw extracurriculars? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, with a heavy heart? Um, absolutely. I, I work in an environment where extracurriculars is highly regarded amongst the teachers. What um, kind of things did you do? Well, um, the school, the, sc the Dalewood School in Hamilton is, um, I mean, almost every sport that you can think of, you know, basketball, uh, there was a baseball team, uh, volleyball, I think that um, uh, we have the track teams, the cross country teams, there's lots of overnight trips that have been postponed. Um, the biggest, uh, I think, impact it's had on our school has been the music program. 
uh, and the phys ed art programs have um, have been um, impacted so on this. All, all of that has come to an end? Um, so within the school, um, outside the instructional hours, those things have come to an end, yes. And uh, I, how many of those things were you actually doing? Um, so I personally uh, was doing uh, lunchtime, um, you know, clubs, that kind of thing. I do a lot of integration of technology in the classroom, and so we did a lot of online gaming. Okay. And so uh, that had to stop a lot of the spec ed students were quite impacted by this. Special education. Special education. Um, a lot of them depended on alternative um, programs over lunch hours, and unfortunately, that had to stop as well. All right, should all of those duties, some of which you have described, some of which Earl has just described, should those be considered part of the job? Um, I think that, it, you know, these issues in my career over the last 12 years, it's, it's never come up. I've always assumed it was part of my job. I think that, um, you know, I went into the field and most of my colleagues have gone into the field because they love extracurricular. They love, it's, it's fun, it's creative, it keeps our minds going, it keeps us engaged in what we do. And, um, and so it was never really a question of whether it was part of our job. It was, you know, as, as we, we just heard, it was part of um, integrating everything else we did. Um, it, it made it better. It made the kids engaged. Um, there was so many, so much good came out of it. But, you know, when this bill and when we started, I, I mean, I, I think of this as a boycott in a sense, and that when we had to take these things away, I think it made us all realize how much we did that was outside the job. Um, Hours and it made uh, there have been teachers at the school I have taught at who have said, "Wow, I can't believe how much more I'm getting done academically in the classroom now." Because they're not doing all those other. Because things. they're not doing all those other things, and it's starting to you know help us um, get ourselves back in track and what, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, what our roles are as educators and um, where we need to go. And and I think that art program and the music program is still thriving within our our school, but. It's just thriving in a different way, and I think people's lenses are changing. Um, I, eventually, I think that we'll get back to these extracurricular activities, but for now, I think it's important for us to have this pause and for us to realize where we're at in education. Okay, let's follow up with George. Yeah. George, what do you teach? Uh, grade three, four, and I teach at Ashton Meadows Public School in Markham. In Markham, in just Markham. north of Toronto. Yeah. And what extracurriculars were you involved with? Uh, basketball, intermediate boys and girls basketball, junior uh, basketball as well, boys and girls, uh, science fair, um, ran the science fair with another teacher, as well as involved in uh, our eco schools program as well. Are those programs, as we speak, happening or not? They are. They are. They are. They are. How come you're back into that? <laughs> um, well, it's my personal belief that when we're talking about creating um, a well-rounded student, that the education of that student goes beyond just the classroom, just sort of the ABCs, one, two, threes is what I've sort of referred to. And uh, Earl kind of mentioned it as well. A lot of what we, we talk about creating that well-rounded kid, that kid who can go in and take on a challenge, um, that kid who can be a leader. And a lot of those things can be done in the classroom, but really it comes with the organization during those extracurricular activities. Great example, we have a, a teacher at school uh, involved in the Meet a Week campaign, and some people might be uh, familiar with that. And she's creating these student leaders, these kids in grade four, five, and six, uh, grade seven, who are going out and, and raising money for uh, water for you know, children in another, another village around, on the other side of the world. And you think, what a, like, teaching these kids to be global leaders and, and, and socially aware is fantastic. And that, you can do that in the classroom, but not to the extent you can do outside the classroom. I know for me, when I look at, because sports has sort of been my main thing, and that's sort of what, what I've been addressing mostly, um, to take a kid, again, 11, 12, 13 years old, and see them carry their team on their back and go into a challenge and they're physically and emotionally and psychologically exhausted and the time's ticking and the, and the pressure's on and they're, maybe they're on the free throw line and the gym's dead quiet and they gotta make that play. And if they make it, fantastic. They've just learned something. They've learned about preparation. They've learned about taking advantage of an opportunity. If they don't, that's also a valuable lesson. And sometimes I have found that's the more valuable lesson actually because now they put everything they had out there they came up a bit short, but they can walk away with their health held high knowing they did that. Did you stop providing those extracurriculars for a while? I did during December, yes. You did for December only? Yes. But then you came back? Yes. Uh, how much trouble did you get in from your union for coming back? Um, I didn't get into any trouble from my union for coming back. Um, <clears throat> when I started speaking out, I started to sort of get... <laughs> okay. uh, that was a little different story. Okay. But, but when I came back, I didn't because legally we had the right to do so. 
Uh, we had the contract, so we were no longer in a collective bargaining uh, situation. And so, therefore, I could go back without facing any retaliation from or retribution from, from I'm, the union. I'm going to hold off on that part of the yeah. story for just a while longer. <laughs> no but, problem. but apparently, I'm inferring from your answers yeah. that you think all of the things that you've just described are part of the job. Is that right? Yeah, I know a lot of teachers aren't going to like me saying that, but I believe it is. Because if we're really concerned about creating that well-rounded student and providing them the best education possible and the best opportunities possible, then that is going to be part of it. And I know that there are kids in my school who have those opportunities outside of school, and I know there are kids that don't. And if we want to create some equal ground for both of those kids to eventually enter the workforce and into life, then we've got to give those the kids who don't have the opportunities the opportunities to do those things. Okay. Them. Stephen Hurley, your turn. What do you teach? Well, I am on a leave right now from Dufferin Peel. I'm uh, on a leave as academic consultant. I'm doing work for the Canadian Education Association. Yes, you are. Okay. When you were teaching, what did you teach? Mainly grades 7 and 8, those, those important years. Okay. And what kinds of extracurriculars did you provide when you were in the classroom? My, uh, my background is the arts. So I uh, did a lot of school musicals over the years and a lot of choirs and a lot of... Uh, keyboard ensembles and instrumental music and a lot of it at lunchtime, a lot of it after school, well all of it because they are extracurricular and I guess that's one of the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, things that has been going through my mind during all of this is that uh, some things are considered extra and some things are considered part of the curriculum and uh, if there is important, and I agree with George, if there is a, as important to the development of children as learning language and math, then why are they extra? And you think they should be part of the job? I think they should be part of someone's job. I think they should be part of the school life. Um, we well, nobody disagrees that they ought to be part of school life. The question is, is it part of the definition of teaching? Well, I think, I think it's part of the definition of teaching that most people entered the profession with. As Zoe said, a lot of people enter the profession thinking that they're going to be a teacher, which includes uh, that whole uh, band of uh, curricular and extracurricular activities. I think it should be. I think most teachers would agree that extracurricular activities are part of who they are. So it's part of the job and therefore you should be paid to do them? Well, we're paid as teachers. I don't think you should necessarily be paid extra or I don't think we should be dividing uh, the day into what is core and what is extra. I think it's part of our life as teachers. Well, help me understand this, because everybody, everybody who's hired as a teacher teaches. But then some teachers do more. They do mm -hmm. the extracurriculars. Mm -hmm. Should there not be some kind of financial remuneration for doing those extras? I don't know. Uh, I don't think so. I, it doesn't sit well with me. Uh, and one of the reasons it doesn't sit well with me is uh, from the perspective of the kids. I think the kids, uh, the students that we have in front of us and that we uh, spend a lot of time with both in the classroom and outside of the classroom, uh, realize that the teachers that are doing extracurricular are putting their time into it. And the students respect you more for it? Uh, they appreciate it. They do. They do. I think they do. And I think if you start to uh, go down that road where you're going to remunerate people for doing extra, uh, I think the kids, uh, the students, are going to sense something different. And I think that's really important. It's kind of hidden underneath the whole conversation, but I think it's there. So uh, again, I'm just trying to understand this here. So, mm -hmm. If it looks like you're doing it for the money as opposed to for the love of the thing, that's what I you're concerned? So. I think so. Okay, understood. Royan, what do you teach? Grade seven at Beverly Acres uh, Public School in Richmond Hill. Richmond Hill, mm -hmm. the premier's hometown, once upon a time. Uh, what extracurriculars do you do? Or um, did you do, should I say? Well, over the years, uh, at Beverly Acres. I've taught at a few schools and at Beverly Acres I've mostly been involved in extracurriculars around uh, technology. Um, we used to run a media club that we called BAPS TV um, so that uh, students could do a lot of multimedia projects that maybe there wasn't uh, enough time for or space for. Are you providing in, those in extracurriculars the, now? No, we're, we're not. Since December you haven't been? Uh, since all year. Since yeah, all year, that's correct. Okay. Uh, at our uh, at our school, we were pretty much on pause from the beginning. What do you think of that? Um, uh, well, there's a lot of different ways you can think about it, but um, one thing's for sure is that um, the more it's helped morale at our school. It's helped morale uh, because among uh, teachers. Among teachers. How about among students? Um, I, I have to say, like just on a personal level that I've probably never had a year of school where um, there has been so much positive energy around the school. And that's one of the, 
I think it's one of the myths about what, it's, uh, what we're going through currently, and it certainly differs from location to location and from board to board. But uh, at our school, I'm, I'm proud to say that um, um, we've really had a great year of reflection. And Who's the we? Everyone. I really okay, here's the, you, yeah. I, I, I certainly, but, but I can hear people. I don't know right what people saying. are thinking. Well, this yeah. is what I want to. Yeah. I want to try and get a better understanding of. <clears throat> I can see people at home right now saying, "Wait a second! They've withdrawn services for five months now, roughly, maybe more." Mm -hmm. And he says morale is up, even though you've denied children things they had well, expected and their parents as well. You know, the year the year can be uh, there's ebbs and flows in every school year, including years when when we have enormous amounts of extracurriculars going on, incredible, incredible projects and incredible um, showcase events and teams and sports and so on. Um, for us, I think the reason I say morale has been relatively high is because the messaging and um, the, the language that we're all using is similar. So we really feel like um, the trust has been maintained throughout the school. Trust among know? whom? Um, uh, I guess from a primary perspective, um, with teachers first. But however, um, you know, m most research will show you, and and uh, you know, even just anecdotally, you will know that if the adults are in conflict, that'll have extremely negative effects on on students, regardless of what programs are on or are off. But the teachers you know? are unified around this declining to give extracurriculars. You believe? Um, we have. Yeah. You have. It. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's move on over to Misha. Misha, what do you teach? I teach English at uh, Dr. Norman Bethune Secondary School, uh, Collegiate Institute in, in the Toronto District School Board. I in teach Toronto. English, yes. Okay, and extracurriculars? Uh, I'm a baseball coach and I coach the debate team. And additionally, I sit on the board of an organization that coordinates all of the competitive debate for um, public high school students in Ontario. So and we have 120 schools from Thunder Bay to Ottawa, public. Uh, we actually have private and parochial schools as well. So. And how much of that have you been providing since September? Well, unfortunately, the organization hasn't been able to run because of um, the lack of support, you know, among, among teachers. But um, if I may sort of start to respond to some of what's been discussed. Go ahead. Um, I'd imagine that, that the case before the Labor Relations Board is going to hang, like most legal cases, on, on the definition of extra, like on definition. Stand by. Yes. You've just brought something new into the conversation that I don't want to assume that our okay. viewers know what's happening. Okay. So there is a case before the Ontario Labor Relations okay. Board. Sorry. Yes. Help us with the background here. Um, well, Earl would be most qualified to do okay. that. Earl, do you want to do that? Won't hang on a definition of a teacher because there isn't an explicit so definition of, of, of a teacher. or of extracurricular. It will it will hang on what is a strike, and the definition in the Education Act about uh, what is a strike is counseling teachers in a concerted way on mass to boycott normal activities related to teaching and learning. What's at stake in this hearing? Well, it, it comes back. It, it does, in some way, come back to uh, you know what are the duties of a teacher. Uh, what what I take issue with is uh, Etfo's belief that uh, teaching begins and ends with a bell, and that the the only thing that that is part of a teacher's job is in the classroom. Uh, I find that 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 as a black and white definition simplistic. Too very narrow? individualistic and very privatized. I don't believe that education and teaching is a privatized or private practice. It is a cooperative, collaborative uh, endeavor, uh, just as, as learning among students is. And so I find that definition and that approach that Atfo's taken has, has created the kind of debate and divisiveness in our society that I thought I fought to the ground uh, 10 years ago when the conservative government had a very simplistic black and white view of what teaching was and was not. We should just explain the, the your perspective on this comes from uh, a number of places. You used to be the head of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Union. Yes. And now you represent school boards. That's correct. So you've got experience on both sides of this. My, my view of teaching was the same then as it is now. It's, it's a broad definition of teaching. and. Uh, and I think that that's what's at stake if, if uh, we continue down this path of boycotting 
or uh, uh, the normal activities associated with teaching and learning. Okay, so. Misha, pick it up if you would. Thanks. Uh, my union is not boycotting uh, extracurricular activities at the moment. We've been instructed to make individual decisions as, as to whether or not we want to take on those additional responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I do not believe it's part of the job. I actually see three distinct categories in our roles. So I see the curricular in the classroom, I see the above and beyond, and then I see extracurricular activities. What, what's the above and beyond? So that's the additional time that we spend on our roles above and beyond the 300 or, or so minutes of classroom instruction. So I'm talking about marking, planning, assessing, evaluating, making sure that we're accommodating adequately for, um, for individual learning needs in our environment. Is that part of the job? That is part of the job, I mean, absolutely. That is so technically my, considered part of the job? Absolutely. Okay. It's a legal requirement. So, so the third part is what we're talking about tonight. My contention is that the, the classroom instruction and the above and beyond are part of our job, but that extracurriculars are an entirely separate category. Why Pri do you feel that way? Um, a number of reasons. Private schools recognize them as such, and they do compensate teachers up to $5,000 for a single team or club to coach, but the public system doesn't do that, and that means that they recognize that it is additional and outside of the job, what or else they wouldn't additionally compensate. What about Stephen's argument that making that somehow a financial transaction between board and teacher, or between student, uh, school and teacher, somehow takes, the kids will know it and takes something away. I agree with that 100%. I'm not at all advocating that the public board should uh, remunerate teachers for extracurricular activity. What I'm saying is that before this fracas began, everything was operating perfectly normally. And um, this sort of, this manufactured uh, uh, crisis, so to speak, is, is the result of, um, of, of an attempt to, to gain majority government, as I've, as I've, as, as I've uh, pointed out in my um, articles before. But, but uh, you know, to go beyond that, I would say that it's very important to be clear on the definitions. Earl, I was flagging the ambiguity that you highlighted earlier in the Education Act about sort of the, the, the teacher's role is, um, is to facilitate learning. Well, what exactly does that mean? And we need to be a little bit more clear. And l luckily, my union is now in a position where it's allowing us to Luckily for me, my union is in a position where it's allowing us to now make those individual calculations. And what calculation have you made? Um, I've decided to, to uh, withhold my extracurricular involvement, but continue to do the absolute best possible job with those first two categories that I mentioned. But if he's right, and the third thing, not just the first two, but the third thing, the extracurricular, ought to be considered part of a teacher's job, mm -hmm. are you denying your students something that they need that is part of the job? To some degree, absolutely, but I think that the question needs to be raised about shared responsibility for this problem. So the issue that I have with defining it as part of the job is that it sends the message very clearly that we're willing to endure any sort of effrontery because no matter what, we're going to continue to do our job as defined as in that particular way. So we're going to cover all three categories, um, irrespective of how we're treated in collective bargaining processes. Okay, Earl wants a fee. follow Our board continues to accept that extracurricular activities are voluntary. But if they are voluntary, it should also mean that the union does not uh, direct, counsel teachers not to participate in, the, in those <coughs> activities when they're not in a legal strike position. And they are not in a legal strike position right now. And so, uh, well, I can understand the union's uh, uh, concern about Bill 115. Uh, you don't develop protest strategies that violate the very bargaining rights that you're trying to, you're saying you're trying to protect. You say you call it concern. Uh, I mean, that doesn't begin to describe the outrage mm -hmm. teachers feel at what they believe to be their constitutionally protected rights that they believe this government unilaterally abrogated. What else can they do? Well, I, I don't disagree with with you that Bill 115 interfered in uh, in collective bargaining rights. I'm opposed to that. Our, our school board is opposed to that. I was opposed to that when I was as, as a representative of, of OSSTF. Uh, I, uh, the NDP interfered uh, with, with, with it. All governments of all stripes have interfered Talking in about collective the social contract. contract. Whether it's a social contract and they appeal to the greater good. Uh, the conservatives interfered in collective bargaining rights and, and used fear to try to garner support and unsuccessfully. And, and, and now the liberals have, have uh, have uh, interfered in collective bargaining and, and really appealed to, to, to greed over the years to say, you know, look at how much we've given you over the last eight or nine mm -hmm. years. That's okay. But this goes back to eight or nine years ago when the government said to all the parties, come and meet with us in a provincial discussion table. Bargaining rights are legislated rights. They're the only things that unions have to hold on to that give them some stature in society. You don't play with them. 
not for love or money. Okay, let's get and some feedback. And that's what happened nine years ago by all the parties. And let me hear from Roy uh, first and then Misha. You want um, to follow up? Well, I don't mean to uh, go off topic here, and ho hopefully this isn't me going off on a tangent, but... Um, I'll let you know. The one thing that, <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that I, I keep asking myself is, um, what is it about extracurriculars uh, that is so amazing? And why does, it, why does it supposedly leave such a void? And I have to admit, even though I, ha I wouldn't call myself a grizzled veteran, you know, I do feel like I've been in the profession for quite a while. How long? Um, almost 10 years okay. now. And, um, and, but still, I was surprised um, this year when I discovered uh, how painful the loss of extracurriculars was. Painful and to whom? To um, various people. You know, we, we heard so many people come out and speak about it, it's parents, uh, from students, teachers, and, and other stakeholders, in fact. And so it, it made me think, you know, what is it about extracurricular activities that, that, um, that, that is so great? And I, and I broke it down and I thought, well, let's think about it. In extracurriculars, there's no curriculum, right? Theoretically, because that's why it's extracurricular. So the teachers have a great deal of autonomy, autonomy to right. do their own thing. Okay. There is um, no real standardized assessment. There is, um, it tends to be growth orientated. Mm -hmm. So we tend to, like, like you were mentioning, um, when you have that student who, 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 who you see achieve something so spectacular or experience a certain kind of failure that is in a, in a momentous learning so experience. So that's why we love it. Yeah, that's why we love it. And, and uh, numerous other things. So I thought, so if we took that away and w we, we are pining for it to return, then does it mean that our classrooms and our regular timetable are not serving those needs, those, those learning needs. So the, what I'm trying to say is, is this a topic, is it a conversation about extracurriculars or does it really, is it a red herring for a real conversation on, like what are we doing with learning okay, in so class? Okay, let's go, let's go. You know? yeah. Gonna have Misha, then Steve, and then Zoe. With all due respect, I don't see that there's any point in extolling the virtues of extracurricular activities because I think we all agree that they're phenomenally important and part of a, an enriched education, which is, our primary concern at this table. But um, Earl referred to the greater good earlier. And, and on that note, you know, I, I think one of the reasons that teachers are, some teachers are choosing to um, continue to withhold that third category of, of extracurricular activity um, is a, a, a very strong sense of the greater good and with an emphasis on the long term. So um, a, a predisposition to, to say, um, if, I, if, <laughs> if I continue to do my job, um, in exactly the same fashion as I did before this unfortunate set of circumstances, um, I'm sending the message that I'm willing to do the same job for 10% less. And you don't want to look like a pushover. Well, I exactly. And I, we sit on a slippery slope because if I'm willing to do the same job for 10% less, then I must be willing to do the same job for 15% less. And who's to say that I shouldn't be willing to do the same job? 20, 25, 30, where do we end? Where do we draw the line? Mm -hmm. So, um, so to me, the greater good is long, the long-term uh, outlook on public education in Ontario. And I don't uh, really agree with the sort of false dichotomy of, of teachers, students, teacher morale, and student morale. I think they're inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. And I think that when, um, when teacher morale is high, schools operate terrifically well, which means that as a pre uh, to predicate any of this discussion, teachers must feel and be respected. And a lot of teachers feel like that respect was taken away, so the response is not to put students in the middle. They feel like a discussion has to be had about the responsibility for the situation. Steve. Great, and I think we like to look upon this as, as a, a linear type of problem to be solved. It's complex and it's naughty with a K, K-N, naughty. But I'd like to pick up on, <laughs> on Royan's point, and I think that is re really one of the accession, uh, essential conversations to have, and going back to George's passion around the need for extracurricular. Um, from a student's perspective, let alone a teacher's perspective, uh, what is it that extracurricular gives not only the individual student, but groups of students and the school community? And I think that's really essential. And I don't think, not to, not to diminish what goes on in the classroom, I don't think you can get there from just the classroom experience. Uh, for the very reasons that Royan has, has indicated, the autonomy and the, the not, and, and I'd love to build some of that into the regular classroom program. But I, I learned so much about myself from people that were willing to put the time in. I learned to play guitar uh, from a teacher in grade eight that taught me how to play the guitar. And that was not in the curriculum. It wasn't in the curriculum. It was on the stage at St. Martin's Junior School. Uh, I learned uh, that I was passionate about radio and television uh, when I was in grade nine, when we had some teacher 
uh, Mr. Skidmore, who decided he was going to run a mock election around election time, and I was in my glory when I walked out of that control room. Of course, I, I took down the whole program by tripping over the main wire, but <laughs> I learned, and that was a passion that has, it, it hasn't gone away, and that's through the extra curriculum. Zoe the Neural. You know, I, I have to say I really resonate with what Roy Ann was saying in regards to the whole school community and how, um, you know, an event like this, what's happened in education um, with these extracurricular um, not being done has, has actually strengthened the community um, big time in, in my school as well. And I, you know, strengthened I, I, the whole community, Zoe? Um, I, I would say that when you walk down the halls now, teachers are talking a lot about, um, about bringing some of the activities that they would have done in the extracurricular into their classrooms. So, you know, it, you, you struck it just, just today, a, a teacher came to me and said, you know, normally the school yearbook would be an extracurricular activity, but I think that I'm going to make that as part of my lead, media literacy program. What do you think? You know, and, you know, and then the, the teacher across the hall coming to me and saying, hey, you know, why don't we um, integrate a, a, you know, a collaborative activity between our two classes that normally we would have done outside the classroom. So I think what it is is that teachers are starting to use more authentic, as I think you use the word authenticity, um, choice. Um, students are starting to feel like they, um, they're doing, the, the school's more fun Do because... Do you not worry, though, that you are violating, in some respects, your union's directive not to provide these services? I, I, I think that I'm not looking at it that way because I'm looking at it in a, in a, in a way that we are stopping and we are reevaluating what education is. And this, this pause is giving teachers a chance to stop and reevaluate the big picture about what we should be doing in education. Earl. So. <laughs> I, I think the debate about whether extracurricular activities are extra or not is, is uh, taking away from the fact that the boycott <laughs> is uh, addressing a whole lot of other things that are part of the normal life of a school. Mm -hmm. Nutrition programs for needy kids are certainly part and parcel of a good education. I think everyone would agree to that. Providing excursions to the local fair or to local businesses to involve the kids in the community. Certainly everyone would agree that that's part of the curriculum and that shouldn't be boycotted, yet it is. Uh, enrichment opportunities like going to our overnight outdoor education center or participating in Meet a We, where in our board, the Meet a We organization actually has their, one of their main headquarters and we have a relationship, a direct relationship with them. Those are things that are part of education and in part of the learning experience and the pursuit of learning that teachers are supposed to be involved in. And yet, in a situation where there's, a, where there, there's not to be any strikes, those kinds of activities are being, uh, teachers are being told not to participate in. And I think they're doing exactly what you're suggesting. How do I get around that directive? By bringing them into the classroom because ETFO in particular, and that's where our, our case is addressed at, is saying that only things in the classroom count, and that's wrong. George. Yeah. I wanted to say, uh, just touch on a couple of points that I've been saying. Um, one of the ones, like Roy was saying about your staff morale and everything, you see, we found the opposite. We found that staff morale was down. People didn't really find it, find it that exciting to come to work anymore. Um, the kids' morale was down. We found behaviors increasing, effort in classes dropping. Sorry, bad, bad behavior increasing? Yes, exactly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, bad behavior increasing. Um, you know, effort in class because I could use that as, as the basketball coach and say, listen, you've got to go to class. I'm not saying you've got to get an A, but you've got to put an effort in and you can't cause a ruckus and you've got to, you know, do what's right. And, and but part of the thing about the extracurriculars too is that some of those kids, what we did in practice, what we learned about, preparation, teamwork, collaboration, okay. Now you're going to use that in the classroom as well. You see how successful it was in the basketball so court? So bring it there. The, the, the carrot of, unless your marks are good, you can't play basketball. Well, it's not marks good. It's not about marks. For me, it's never about marks. It's about, it's about effort. Because okay. the same thing I say about on the basketball court. We don't have to win, but i got to see you put your best effort forward. And if we put our best effort forward and we lose every game, that was our best effort. That's right. all you can do. If we win and we put our best effort, then we see the value. But that, that carrot is gone now. You it's gone now, right. And the other part was, um, I think it was always saying, I've heard this argument too, a lot of teachers saying, well, now I can do more in the classroom. I find myself doing more in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of people aren't going to like my answer, but if, if your extracurricular activities were getting in the way of you doing stuff in the classroom, then you shouldn't be doing extracurricular activities. 
And I know for me that if I'm running a basketball tournament at our school till 9, 9.30 at night and I got to go home, but if I show up the next day and I got literacy first thing in the morning and my literacy lesson isn't up to par, I expect my principal to tell me, you should have been you know, at school until 9, 9.30 at night. That's great that you did it, but it's interfering with your classroom stuff. So I don't really buy that argument. I think that if you can't do it, you can't fit it in, you can't fit in. And just another point, what Steven said about, um, you know, we were talking about the payment of extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard a lot of teachers saying that it would be nice to have that because it does irritate them sometimes when you see some people that are leaving and they're making more money than you and you're kind of like, you know, I'm putting in a lot of extra time here. But they don't mind. I mean, I went into it knowing I wasn't going to make the same as someone else, but I love doing it. But I think there's a perception in the public that we did or we're getting paid for it. Maybe not so much now with it being in the media. But I know from talking to students and talking to even parents who have you know, their kids that have been on my basketball teams for three, four years, and they said, you weren't getting paid all that time? And I was like, no, I wasn't. And, and that perception that we were getting paid. So I don't think it necessarily would change how. So this clarifies that anyway. Yeah. OK, yeah. Misha, then Zoe. Sure. Um, on the point that Zoe raised earlier, to which uh, George just referred, I, I uh, alluded, I think that the classroom has to be lively all the time. I mean, the, saying that people have used the disappearance of extracurricular activities to enrich their classroom practice, to me, doesn't mean anything, no offense. I don't think it has a lot to do with the extracurricular discussion at all. I think, I think classrooms should be um, differentiated and alive and musical and kinesthetic all the time. You know, we should, we should be, um, that's part of that second category to me. Um, outstanding practice. And that's part of a larger conversation about professional development. But I think that's a totally separate issue. Um, Earl once again alluded to the ambi definitional ambiguity. He said that, um, but denied that it existed. He said that, that, that um, we'd all agree, I'm sure we'd all agree that that's part of education. Uh, of course we'd all agree that it's part of education, but education breaks down into a number of different components. If we're going to say that teachers are responsible, entirely responsible, for all facets of education, irrespective of how they're being treated, then again, we're entering a very dangerous zone where there are no reasonable limits set on, 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 our, on our professional activities or our workload. One more thing. I think it's really important um, to point out that I'm not speaking on behalf of my union, my board, my school, or anyone else. It's just personal opinion. Um, but, you know, and I'm not suggesting that any individual should or shouldn't do you know, any particular thing. I think that's really important. I think diversity and democracy in the teaching population is really important. I think this is something to, to embrace, the, the difference of opinion in, to some degree. But, um, I see it, quite frankly, um, personally, as, as, as a matter of um, setting a reasonable limit. Again, you know, if, if um, we, again, and we've all, uh, we've all come back to this, this conversation about how valuable extracurriculars are. I don't think that's being disputed here, and I wish we'd sort of move okay. on from it. Zoe? Um, the one thing that I'm thinking about in this conversation is how many people out there in, um, in different, how many, how many different teaching environments we have in <coughs> Ontario. I think we have 72 districts, correct? Is that right? And that, you know, in, 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 <laughs> we'll within, I don't know. <laughs> that, There's a lot, yeah. yeah but you know, and I, I'm, I'm just looking at my perspective even just in my perspective, in my district in Hamilton and how different one school environment is than another. And I've taught in classrooms where at the end of the day, at the end of my instructional hours, I don't have anything left. You know, I'm, I'm exhausted. You know, I've gone through different parts of my life where I've, you know, had to be at working part time, you know, being a parent at home and so on, that it's, it's impossible for me to put any more after school and to be able to, um, you know, be able to have, have been a social worker all day long, help students get fed, help students who are crying, help students who, um, who, have parent, who have parents who are in, in, in the midst of breakups, dealing with um, you know, uh, puberty issues, <laughs> you know, I mean, you name it, um, we're dealing with it in, in the classroom, uh, outside instructional hours, you name those three things, Absolutely. but I would name there's a fourth thing there so that, that, you know, that teachers are doing all day long, constant problem solving, constant um, work. It's emotional for teachers. It is there, I can't think of any other job where you, no matter what, even what you're going through, you have to be facing with a strong face and you have to be there for those kids and help them and well, support them. And, and I just want to, to say that my job where I am right now is in one situation. It, it, it's working quite nice. It's a nice school. But you know, there are other schools that it, it, it's not like that. And in, in rural Ontario and where there's alcoholism and where there's other mental health issues. And so we can't say the same thing for one district as we're saying for sure. the other. It's one not line equitable. Line one line fast. So. fast, one letter. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I think the argument that extracurriculars I, should be part of someone's job is predicated on a misunderstanding of what teachers do. And that was what Zoe's just talking about proves that point. So. Okay, let me, cut. we've Thank had you. a ton of, um, feedback on our website and I've wanted to sort of work some of the comments in but you guys have been terrific holding up the discussion here so 
but let me try and sneak this one in here. This is from the retired vice principal of the Bishop Strawn School, who wrote on our website, I worked in a private school, and I think the teacher's contracts should include a sentence about teachers being expected to be involved in the life of the school, including extracurricular activities and any other facets of school life as requested by the principal, including but not restricted to meetings, coaching, interview with parents, extra help, etc. Make the principal responsible for teacher involvement, not the board. No extra pay needed as all are to be involved. Now, Stephen, this is the private school approach. Got any issue with this? No, I like it. How about for public schools? Does it work there? I like it for public schools as well. We're de we're de I know people don't agree, but I, we're dealing with the same type of child. Why, why should a student in a private school get uh, services that um, exceed what you would get in a public school? Earl? The Education Act duties of the teacher is not as vague as Misha would try to say my comments were. It does say that uh, teachers have a duty to cooperate and act collegially with all staff. Absolutely. Not just teachers, Absolutely. other professionals, other agencies, uh, support staff, in ensuring that the life of a school, the culture of a school, the students' needs are met. I agree that, that teaching and education has become far more complex and that we're dealing with a myriad of issues. And that's why our school board, the school board I represent here tonight, uh, has instructional leads to assist uh, teachers in their professional growth, has uh, contracts with third-party agencies, makes mental health issues a priority. And just this week, when there was a meeting of elementary school teachers and administrators from all of our elementary schools, they identified as one of our strengths is we have a, a culture of collaboration, a culture of support for teachers and, and their own learning, and that we make restorative practices, mental health issues, and whatever, a priority because we recognize that the whole school and the community are part of the classroom experience. Okay. Can I and that's Misha? what's at issue Briefly here today. Can, yeah, can I just reiterate that that isn't the private school approach because, as I said earlier, they do compensate teachers for extracurricular activities, and I know them you know, the, the, my friends in the debate community... Do they all? Or some do and some don't? I'm not in a position to say that all of them do, right. but a lot of my friends in the debate community certainly receive the stipend that I mentioned earlier because okay. their administrators recognize that it's above and beyond the contract, and their salaries aren't artificially lowered to compensate for that. Okay. Um, Let me, sorry. Can I do one more here? Three, of course. I want to get one more on here. This is... I know we had a group of teachers in here a few weeks ago, and one of the things that really came through in that discussion was how appalled they are that they feel so, many of them anyway, despised now by members of the public, disrespected, the whole nine yards. So we got this here. This is, um, we got via Facebook. For a year now, this is board three, everybody. For a year now, and I do not exaggerate, teachers have been called child abusers, child attackers, hurting, damaging, and harming to children, hostage takers, destroying and ruining children's lives, greedy, lazy union scum. For people who intrinsically care for children very much, it is not possible to take that repeated barrage and not take it extremely personally nor become very defensive. Okay, Royan, is that right? Does that feel right to you? Um, I, <clears throat> I don't share the, the kind of what I consider a myth that, that there's this widespread hatred of teachers and of education. Um, I, of course, I'm a human being, so when I to flip on the news, and I see something that either misrepresents the teaching profession or includes voices, often anonymously, that um, uh, disparage us. Of course, it hurts me a little bit, but in the, in the overall picture, I, I still feel like a very well-respected, high-level professional. How about you, George? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think overall the public does respect us. I think um, you have to understand that obviously um, education, and when you do, anytime you're dealing with kids, it's an emotional issue for people. And for, uh, as a parent, uh, my kids are too young right now to really be involved in a lot of the extracurriculars. But I mean, if my kid came home and was upset because something had been taken away from them that they were looking so forward to, of course, as a parent, I'm going to be defensive in that um, and, and want that for my child but to have. have you felt under siege during <clears throat> all of this? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. I, we have a little bit, I guess. I have a lot of friends in the corporate world, and they're like, oh, you guys, and your summer's off, and all that kind of stuff. And to what Zoe said, you know, a lot of people don't see all that sort of social work we do and all that other part we're doing. Like you, you're trying to get a kid to, to do some reading or some math, and, and the kid's got something else going at home, and so you got to counsel them on that. Meanwhile, you got to juggle all the other kids over here and, and keep that going. And, and it is. It's very exhausting. I mean, I used to work in, in the corporate world and in the private sector, and 
I said to my friends that are still there, I said, listen, you can take a two-hour lunch if you want. You know, I can't. Um, I just can't sort of walk around from the office. I can work a half day when I was in the private sector. I worked half as hard. I made double the money. Um, but this is a more fulfilling job. I come home, I'm more tired, but I'm more, I'm, I'm more happier. And I wanted to say um, also to, to Royan's point, too, um, about the public, I think that one of my gripes has been is that um, in what we're doing is we're giving that perception that we don't care about the kids. So, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> we could easily change our, our focus and say, you know, we're going to give back extracurricular activities to kids as long as the government continues to talk. And that was been one of my points that full. And then all of a sudden that changes. Now we put the pressure on the government. Now we're the good guys because we're giving the public what they want. And now the government's got to keep it up. They've got to keep up to make some strides with us in order to keep the public happy. And the last Ipsos repo that I saw, I mean, it's going back to February. It was actually before the um, political protest day, which I assume now it's gone gone down, but it was an Ipsos read poll um, that had us a 30% public support. And us that, meaning who? Uh, teachers. And, and teachers in, in, our, in our fight. And I thought, that's not good. You know, we need the public on our side, and we work for the public, and the public should entrust us with their children um, for what we're doing. And I think when and the public has trust in us, um, and the public wants us to do well, because they know that um, education and healthcare are the foundations of any civilization, any society. I truly believe that. And, and I think the public sees that. They know there's value in education, and they want the best education. education. So if we give them the perception that we are providing that to them, then they really don't have a gripe against us. Stephen. And I think, I think the research <coughs> over the years, the, the public opinion polls right across Canada will show that uh, most parents support the work of their individual schools and the individual teachers in those schools generally. And this is where it gets a little messy because we tend to want to paint this monolithic picture of, of what teachers are and what the public opinion is. And I think there's generally a lot, a lot of trust and a lot of support still active in the system. Well, don't misunderstand this next question. And Michelle, I'll get you to comment on it first. But uh, the producer of this program, Sandra Jonas, told me she had a hell of a time trying to get anybody to come on this program. We are delighted that you folks accepted her invitation, but you don't know how many people she had to invite in order to get you six here. And the most popular reason given by people she invited to be on this program for their not wanting to appear on this program was, you people in the media all hate us. Misha, how much, is that, how much of that is out there? I have a slightly different experience of this phenomenon because um, I've had to deal with in incredibly vitriolic responses from <clears throat> anonymous commenters on my blog and, and on particular articles that I've written on the subject. So it takes a lot of guts to anonymously flame you, doesn't <laughs> oh, it? <laughs> yeah. I really admire their courage. And being facetious, yeah. of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so my experience of it is different. I have unfortunately had to, to um, encounter and, and overcome you know, a, certain, a certain tenor that, that I'm uncomfortable with. Because I don't like unnecessarily confrontational approaches to anything, you know, particularly not But do you this, think the media where, coverage has been unfair okay, so, and demonized you? Um, not me personally, but I, but I do feel that, that um, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think people are likely to come back and revisit media sources who are valid, that are validating their angst. So in, in this particular case, when you have you know, um, writers saying, suggesting, for example, that you know, unions are responsible for precarious employment in society, I mean, I think that's absurd. Um, I think unions protect people, in this case, the people on whom our children rely from precarious employment. Um, and, and so when you hear such Com, you know, sort of confrontational and, and disputable topics as, as that, and and the role of the media, of course, is to you know to be provocative and then to um, you know get get people to to visit their site or, or buy their paper or you know watch the show. Okay. Um, well, let me ask a bigger question here, then, if I can, and that is, and let's put up board four if we can here, control room, uh, which goes as follows: This is one large negotiation, and I find the tactics of withdrawing services that affect students to be a decision that has forced me to pull my kids out of the public school system and pay for services I can count on. And I wonder, let's go around on this one, I wonder how many of you are concerned that for all of the good reasons that you've put forward today, that you've been unhappy with the government's Bill 115 approach, that you may be trying to win that battle, but the longer range conclusion of all this will be losing the war, and that people will lose faith in you, in public education, and that that's worse. Stephen? Yeah. You're not worried about that? I'm not worried about that at all. I think the value of public education in a democratic society uh, speaks for itself. It's strong, and I think most people understand that. I think in discrete 
cases. You may find parents upset that uh, extracurriculars or whatever, the quality of teacher or whatever, will force them out of the system. But I have no uh, doubt that public education will continue to be strong in this country. Zoe? I, I agree with Stephen. I think <coughs> that um, if anything in this day and age, we are um, using, um, as you mentioned on your blog there, that we are being more transparent. We are talking about these issues. We are using feeds like Twitter. Uh, we are communicating, all parties are communicating. We are getting strong support from our ministry colleagues, from our ETFO, or OTF colleagues for professional development and, in those and areas. And you don't hear anecdotally, and, if this keeps up, I'm pulling my kids from know, public school. But we do, but I don't think that that would be the majority. I think that, that Ontario majority, is a, a strong regarded public system, and I don't think that this, I think that this is one, er, one um, you know, a, halt in that and, and maybe a few people do. Th I don't think that's a majority. I really don't. Earl. I can tell you that school boards already can see that uh, uh, there's a, a potential here of losing students from the public school system to the Catholic school system or to the private school system and it's very real and uh, that's unfortunate. Can I just understand that losing potential to the Catholics because the Catholic teachers settled. Mm -hmm. Is that part of it? Yes. And, 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 and that, I think that uh, uh, both OSSTF and ATFO need to keep that in mind. Um, well, they would say that's really for the boards and the government to keep well, in no, mind, wouldn't they? Well, uh, no, I went through an ordeal, uh, and, and teachers went through an ordeal in, in a, with a previous government that not only tried to take a billion dollars in funding out of the public education system, they attacked teachers directly. The Liberal government has not done that, yet the, the situation we find ourselves in right now is creating an environment for that same kind of attitude to rise again, and you can hear it all the time from the current Conservative government, and our school boards are seeing parents say, if I want my kids to get a well-rounded education, which we all seem to believe in, then I'm going to move them out of the public school system. And I don't think that OSSTF or ETFO should ignore that. But let's do some math here. I, th I think you're referring to the Mike Harris years, the political protest, 1998, when I think the public school system educated 96% of the children in this province, and now maybe today, after all of the agonies, it might be 95%? Well, we obviously did a good job then, Stephen. Can I add some <laughs> current context here? Two minutes left. Go ahead, sure. Misha. I agree a lot with what Earl just said. And, and to add some current context, my impression is that that fear did actually influence OSSTF's decision to some degree to, um, to return, to, to, to discontinue the instruction that teachers were to, to cease to and allow distance. extracurriculars Thank if you. teachers wanted them to. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, and, and that's because, um, and this is very legitimate, I think, the, unions, the union has a responsibility to protect jobs. That supersedes any sort of uh, concerns about the contract. And if students are being taken out of the, the, the board, then teacher enrollment goes down and teachers lose jobs, as they are and they will be. So Let um, me save a little time for George here. Go ahead. Answer. Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to say I'm glad I'm here by default. So that was... Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, appreciate that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, but I know, I, I, I know... Um, uh, I've had some correspondence with uh, Warren Kennedy, the director of uh, Greater Essex County um, School Board, and I know read, from reading some of the stuff he's published that that was a concern for him as well, students leaving his public school board and realizing that, you know, we're, we're, pushing, we're pushing the envelope here. That, and again, it might not be a lot, but even 1%, if you think across the province, is going to be a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. um, the other part is uh, you brought up about the conservative government, and that's been my sort of gripe. I said, are we pushing sorry. this conservative... What am I missing here? Oh, sorry. You no. talked about the conservative government a little bit, the previous conservative I, government. Oh, you're talking about yeah. the previous years. No, okay. it, well, and, and the and current... And this current, right. Current okay, well, they're not the government yet. They're no, 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 but, but what I'm saying is... Conservative we're, party. Yeah, right. And we're, we know that education can swing an election. We, I mean, we've seen it happen before. Yeah. And and if if the conservative party, as ETFO members, union members, were concerned about the conservative party getting in in their messages right now, if we... Um, he's saying the right things, the Conservative Party, or Hudak, Tim Hudak, if you will, saying the right things as, to sway the public to his side because that's what they want to hear. I'm going to give you back extracurricular activities. I'm going to reduce the pensions, all that kind of stuff. And even if that's not even feasible or possible, he's saying the right things to get elected. And I've said to Edfo in, in, in some of my correspondence with him, we're, 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 we're towing a fine line here. We're really walking a fine line. And we've got to be careful because we could push the public that direction. And then where are we going to be long term? George, that's the last word on the program today. And you may think you were here by default, but no. not true. <laughs> we were we're delighted to have all of you on the program tonight. We thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us here on TVO. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.